Shalom, Rastafari. I had actually left off uh, speaking about the speaking about the Zagways, right? And the Zagwe, um, based on our going over. This will be the part two uh, video. And just to connect, if one is just viewing the part two and didn't get to see the part one, we're recommending um, Dr. Bernard Lehman's uh, research here that we have available at Rastafari Foundation, on Rastafari Foundation right here, Queen of Sheba and Biblical Scholarship. And you can uh, download it. Our members can download it and see about 21 members download it. We should be able to, you know, have a, have a book study or a research, a scholarship study on this particular work and um, produce some sort of a, you know, an output, a dissemination to the brothers and sisters to encourage more study of this. Because this document I had come across a couple of years ago and it was such a, um, such a benediction to I and I study to my heart and to what I already had research. But one thing that I think was key about um, Dr. Lehman's work, um, I found was the maps and the focus on on geography, right, of, of geography. Because when one's talk about, well, how come such and such things are not found? And this is also from uh, another page right here, Dr. Bernard Lehman, Africanus, an article he has right here, um, Illuminating a Lost Ark. Dr. Bernard Lehman helps resolve a crisis in Old Testament scholarship. Um, and this one's focusing on the Ark of the Covenant. And he has has a few, uh, uh, several actually. I know like two or three of them I'm, I'm familiar with. I'm sure there's probably other researchers. But one of, I think, the quintessential research, the one that really got me um, into um, his work and even willing to go forward and highly recommend his scholarship for my brothers and sisters and all others who really want to know the true facts concerning the Queen of Sheba and biblical scholarship because in the academias and the universities, people are not getting it, right? And he goes into a little bit of that um, actually right here in the foreword of this book. The last line, he says... um, well, actually, the last two lines at this book, it argues that Old Testament, that the Old Testament is an accurate record because many say, well, it's not accurate because what they claim to be, you know, what, what and where, where is all off. Right. Therefore, we have to reexamine and reexamine the Kabbalah and the guests. This is what he has done. So therefore, it argues that the Old Testament is an accurate record, but the events it describes prior to 586 BCE took place not in Palestine or what's called Palestine, but in West Arabia and to a lesser extent in Ethiopia and Eritrea. It suggests that scholars are unwilling to consider such a strong possibility, you know, as a Western Gentile academia. And I think a, a strong tinge of um, satanic delusion and racism has, has mixed in with this. So it's, it's not a, in truth, a, it's about truth. But one's one to ignore that for the Jews who call themselves Jews and therefore those who have evidence like the Ethiopians at home and abroad and in particular, um, the Kubernetes is one particular evidence that hasn't been considered, um, ones that haven't studied it uh, seriously, you know, haven't given it serious scholarship because even as a cursory reading, you'll recognize that there is something similar in what you've heard, but it's, it's a whole different, um, interpretation. I think that's the key right there because if uh, this is true, and I say, I, amen, I mean, it is true, it would not only completely undermine the um, raison d'etre, the reason d'etre, the reason for being of the state of Israel, or Rothschild, something like that they should call it, but it would also force a total reassessment of biblical, 
Arabian and Northeast African history. I mean, that in itself is a new day. That in itself is a new world right there. Because, you see, the New World Order is, is not really even new. The dollar bill will tell you that. But the the true New World of Christ is based on this foundation. And this is why this information and more information that backs it up, reflects it, or references it, is coming out right now. But we had left off on, I just wanted to give a kind of overview, but you know how we do. Right. And once again, Dr. Bernard Lehman, we have requested and putting forward a request to republish on the line of Judah Society Press to republish uh, this book, this scholarship. You can find it here on Rastafari Groundation, a PDF. And we see within his uh, foreword, he basically says it can be um, sold, uh, distributed, you know, in other words, he recognizes as a true scholarship the importance and also the rareness of such a work. So we was at this particular map right here. We had left off on some earlier maps. Now, this right here is a map of the linguistics and the language, right? The Shemitic languages of Ethiopia and the Agal, the central Cushitic um, uh, remnant isolates. Now, I had left off on the fact that the Agal, from the Agal people, we have the Zagwe or the Zagwe. We have the Zagwe people. And the Zagwe people um, are the ones, um, their kings are the ones responsible for the 11 rock-hewn monasteries like the, like uh, La Labella within Ethiopia, the rock hewn church and the other monasteries. Now this is also very, very interesting. But the King of Kings says that the dynasty is without interruption. And this is kind of getting into another related subject matter right here. But um it's just make a note of the Agal. Because the Agal people, some say that the the so called black Jews or the uh Falashas, the Beta Israel of Ethiopia, right, are heavily Agal people. Now, if we get a little deep into the Kibr Neges, the Queen of Sheba, the, 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 the book, the manuscript, and even some of the oral traditions, um, legend states that King Solomon first had um, Congress or sexual intercourse with Queen of Sheba's and her maid. And you'll see in some of the paintings that there are two children. Right, there's two children returning to Ethiopia. I think that's significant. I don't know if others have noticed that, but I like to just point that out right here. And um any of the scholars out there that perhaps have noticed that or um would like to work together on that, you know, we just need to call a conference, make that time, make the dialogue and utilize this technology to get more information disseminated and distributed. And this particular work right here is a very key work. So he goes on to another map was the major Middle Eastern and North East African land and sea trade routes in ancient times. Right? What were the trade routes? And we can see the significant of these places like Egypt here, right? Thebes, Jerusalem, or what ones might say is the latter Jerusalem. But let's just look at it as it is right here. Also, Adulis and, and, uh, um, Africa or Ethiopia, Kush right here. Aden, or we have Aden right down here. Let's lift this up right here. We have Aden, which is Aden, the Gulf of Aden, or the Garden of Eden. The Garden Eastward in Eden, and here are sea routes, which also link China and India. And we know we have um, Hebrew diasporas in China, as far as China and in India. So we can see this link when we start to really recognize the significance even of such things as trade, right? Trade and commerce and, and goods, um, incense and gold and even luxury items, you know, in ancient times. So we have these other maps as well. Some of the other maps, and I want to hail up again, Ross Pat- Patrick, um, for his co-labor um, on the maps. Now, like we said, we don't have the opportunity right here to get into, um, you know, great detail, you know, um, 
great detail here, but this is a very, very important work, and I hope and pray you'll be able to download it, and I hope to be able to communicate with um, Dr. Bernard Lehman about getting a, a, a printing of this particular document on the Lion of Judah, the Society and I and I College um, Press, you know, to get a reprint of this particular document. It would appear based on his the opening introduction in the red that we read before that that would not be a problem. But we like to also to communicate to him, and if he can even write a foreword, perhaps for us and for our universal university, you know. Now the geography of Minlix or Minulix root, according to the Kabbalah Neges, with Jerusalem in Palestine and Misa, Misraim, Mitraim translated to mean Egypt, Jerusalem, Gaza, the border of Egypt, the waters of Ethiopia, the brook of Egypt, the sea of Eritrea, arrival in Ethiopia, right, opposite of Mount Sinai or Sina. So this is um taking the same information and always taking the same basic information and applying this to maps and saying, wait, the way we've been told, you understand, um, it is, it's not the way, it's, it's as if it were, but it's not the way that it really is. And some have alleged that the Kibbutz or the Queen of Sheba and only son Minulik is not accurate, you know, and that now that's based on the Western Gentile um, sources and also way, uh, based on academia and scholarship, right? which in collaboration with the synagogue of Satan has suppressed much of this information or just ignored it, just ignored it. And whenever it has been um, brought into the front and the mainstream, like whenever we speak about this, they'll say, oh, it's a legend. And it's, it's like, it's like make believe. But here, this scholar, Dr. Bernard, Lehman, this Africanist, he has taken the time to research this, right? And also to provide us maps. And based on that, we can say that the testimony that is found in the Kubernetes is not make-believe, you know, if you would just take the time to do the research, right? And it was his maps, especially the map that we showed previously. We're just scrolling through it right now in the few uh, minutes that we have here. Um, but this is very important, and hopefully that will be one of the projects that we will be able to commence with. We have some other projects that we are working with on some other brothers. Um, Ross John in particular has a work that we are doing some of the pre-editing of, um, very important work. We hope to have that forward by um, I and I Father's Day by July 23rd. Right, Mount Sinai, a revisioning of Mount Sinai right here. Um, and it's not saying that this is what it is, but it's taking the evidence, the written evidence, and other scholars also, you know, it's more than, you know, more than ones like Dr. Lehman and others. I mean, there's been a lot of scholars. I like to always trace it back to Macy who I think really was a kind of an undercover Ethiopianist, Gerald Macy, because even from his first book, The Book of the Beginnings, um, I did a little word search on how many times Ethiopia or Ethiopic was found within that text. And it was very interesting that um, that's often what's ignored in whether it is a study of ancient Egypt, whether it's a study of the Bible, um, whether it's study of history or ancient times, the Ethiopian witness is often ignored. And now post, um, rebellion Ethiopia, 1975 Ethiopia is apostate and there's, there's much to be desired, especially among those who have gone astray from the covenant. However, Prior to that time, for thousands of years, Ethiopians have been considered by many, not by themselves, it's not them praising themselves, but others as a, um, as a honest, a forthright, a people of integrity, a people of honor, right? And their 